Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger, and we have just wrapped up our series on the Ten Commandments, but we're not quite done with them yet. Wahahaha. Um, there is an economist by the name of Thomas Sowell, a very good economist. He has a book called Basic Economics, which is very long. But its only <laughs> shortcoming is its long going. I feel like the the problem with economics books is that Henry Hazlitt already wrote economics in one lesson. <laughs> so can someone write economics in two lessons or five or you know something? But when one does the trick, <laughs> um, no. But it, Thomas Sowell's book is very good. He wrote another book um, called A Conflict of Visions that we're going to be using this week and next week. Um, in it, he divides all political and economic thought into two camps. And the idea is either you believe that man's nature is perfectible, that we can change, that we can shape man's nature, or you don't believe that. Either you believe man's nature is unconstrained, meaning it can become anything, or it's constrained. It kind of is what it is, and it has limitations, and you have to work with those limitations. Um, so what does this have to do with the Ten Commandments, Greg? Why are we still talking <laughs> about the Ten Commandments? There are a number of reasons we're still talking about the Ten Commandments, and in large part, uh, using uh, Thomas Sowell's book as sort of a, a subterfuge to go on talking about the Ten Commandments. <laughs> um, let me give you a very practical, here's why kind of thing. Uh, my wife, I think, is just finishing up talking about the Ten Commandments in her Bible class at school. And she started by asking her children, this is a Christian school. These students are from Christian churches of various sorts. All We have like 20 different denominations or more represented in our school. She she asked her students, how many of you at, you know, at some point during the year in your services recite the Ten Commandments? No hands went up. How many of you have heard a sermon on the Ten Commandments? No hands went up. How many of you have the Ten Commandments memorized? No hands went up. Uh, I don't remember what else she asked, but it was along those lines. Here is the newest generation of Christians in a Christian school, and they don't know what the Ten Commandments are. My wife summed it up as they still look at it as, as a list of rules. Hmm. So it, it, it behooves us while we're here to sort of tread water for a little while. And, and we, we've looked at the commandments individually, but I think it's now to look at them uh, as a whole and, 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 and kind of walk back through the steps one more time, or two more or three more, depending, to see that these are not just a list of Sunday school things of, of rights and wrongs that either are so obvious that no one should care or uh, restrictions um, so so enormous that no child should ever have to worry about them. And then there's always the the concern of the churches and what do you do when you get to adultery? <laughs> I did yeah. notice that in the in the little song that our, that the kindergartners at our school learn, when they get to seven, it's it's not what the actual seventh commandment is. Yeah. I, have you noticed that? that? Yeah, it's and we didn't write the song, and there's only so many things that are available. Our teachers, by and large, are actually better than that. I remember it, actually being taught when I was a little kid, and I looked at the Ten Commandments. I remember I didn't know that word adultery, so I asked right. what it meant. And what my mother, bless her heart, told me was not what adultery actually meant. She defined slander or something. I don't know if maybe she misheard me or something, but I felt like that was really typical. Like I that remember, didn't, that yeah, didn't I remember, mean what I thought that meant. Yeah, I remember being being a fairly small child, and I was taught very plainly it meant you can't have more than one wife. Mm. I don't know how old I was when I found out differently. Mm. Uh, we we are embarrassed by sexuality, and so one more reason not to talk about the Ten Commandments. And then there's the whole dispensational backdrop of the last few generations that says commands law as law is itself evil and old covenant mm -hmm. and gone and it is for it is now forbidden to forbid mm -hmm. uh, what we need is the law of christ which may constitute all the things he says in the gospels or may simply be the holy spirit prompting us to be kind and loving but 
even among um, conservatives who in theory say, yes, these are things that God talks about, that he commands in both Testaments, there's still uh, a reluctance to spend any great amount of time with them, may maybe to cite them very quickly. We can think of, um, you're going to have to help me with the name here, uh, Hell's Best Kept Secret, um, the gentleman who does apologetics by uh, going down to the beach and asking people. Oh, uh, Ray Comfort? Ray Comfort, yeah, sure. He does a great job with the Ten Commandments. He'll just mm -hmm. talk to people and say, here's here's what the law says. Have you done this? And they'll say, uh, no. Well, what, what, what should happen? I should go to hell, I guess. Yeah, you should. In, in our generation, amongst evangelical Christians, he's been one of the few who's actually spent a lot of time. There are others who have certainly uh, signed on to it and said, yes, this there is law in, in, in grace. John MacArthur, for instance. But it's it's just the, the, the ignorance of Christians in the 21st century of the most basic Christian morality is appalling. And then we look at the world and complain how evil it is. You know... <laughs> Another example, a while back there was this movement to put copies of the Ten Commandments in all public schools. Uh, one commentator said, isn't this ironic because don't most Christians believe this is Old Covenant and doesn't apply? They don't have it in their churches. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> How much of this is a symptom of what we see in history education? Maybe it's the, the same underlying fault that we don't learn dates anymore that the you know the 10 commandments is kind of oh that's sort of sunday school stuff it's kind of beneath us we will acknowledge them with a nod but not really talk about any of what the commandments actually are kind of like how you know you learn about christopher columbus but i don't think a lot of people learn dates anymore even though it's sort of the vocabulary of history vocabulary and structure i don't know that's an interesting thought I imagine there are a great many reasons we don't study the Ten Commandments because the enemy's been busy. He doesn't. He doesn't like them, <laughs> and so <laughs> there's any, an extra uh, antipathy there. <laughs> yeah. So on in any hand, he's going to look for ways of. Oh, this is a convenient heresy, and it attacks the Ten Commandments. Here's a good heresy. Oh, and it undercuts the Ten Commandments. Oh, here's another heresy, and it will cause them never, ever to read or memorize the Ten Commandments. You know, so it's just because remember the, the basic sin is sin, transgression of God's law, contempt for what God has commanded, uh, and an assistance that we should be able to define right and wrong on our own terms. You shall be as God, deciding for yourself what's good and evil. Anyway, with that as a background, we we want to talk about Ten Commandments this week and next week, and probably for a couple more weeks after that from different different angles, uh, and always reminding any nervous listener out there that, no, we are not advocating salvation by works. We're not advocating legalism because a proper understanding of God's law is the exact opposite of legalism. Legalism is when you, one, make up your own laws <laughs> and try to enforce them on other people. Two, actually think you can keep God's law and get some kind of blessing. And the more you understand God's law, the more you're going to see that doesn't work. So a faithful presentation of God's law actually undercuts any kind of legalism and drives them into Christ, but it also shows Christians uh, the nature of God, the nature of Christ, uh, both as the second person of the Trinity and in his humanity as he submitted to the Father's will, and what love is, if you love me, keep my commandments. So there, there are lots of good reasons for for doing this, and so we're going we're gonna to start here with um, Thomas Sowell's uh, idea of the unconstrained vision. This is this is uh, the thing born in the Enlightenment, in the coffee houses and book rooms of France on the eve of the Revolution. Uh, this this wonderful thing where a bunch of intellectuals, intellectuals and journalists sat down and said, "Aren't we great? We are philosopher kings. Oh, that I had the power to!" And within a generation or so, they did. And it didn't work well, but no one really remembers that. <laughs> and the beat goes on. If we just had, we could just apply raw human rationality intelligence to the problems of life, then we could fix everything. And the problem is, on the one hand, with ignorance, uh, people uh, don't know enough. They're not educated enough. They don't know how to think. 
particularly because they've been blinded by superstition, read religion, read Christianity, uh, or because of their socioeconomic condition, they don't have opportunities for uh, for learning and for education anyhow. So uh, in their name and for their sake, we who are learned and intellectual and sophisticated and rational can forge new trails and find out what would really work and would really make the world better. And, and knowing this, we should act on it immediately because obviously we're right, because we're smart, we're rational, we think, uh, we know how to use the laws of logic, we know how to construct an argument, and so having done so, there's absolutely no reason not to implement these changes now. And anyone who disagrees with that obviously is either stupid and should be asked kindly to step out of the way before we run them over with our bulldozer, uh, or they're evil. And if they're evil, well, they are beneath contempt and should be removed in some hygienic way as quickly as possible. Uh, and, and, and that's that. And, and so since the, the later 1700s, the days of the French Revolution, this has been an ongoing theme in West, first in Western Europe, then in America, now to the ends of the earth. It is the basic assumption underlying all forms of socialism today, progressivism, and of course, Marxism. Uh, and, and what we generally call liberalism in its milder, gentler form. Uh, we are good people. Man is potentially or actually good. The things that are keeping him from truly bringing that goodness out in the open are his associate, the elements within his socioeconomic environment. If we can change these, uh, we, we can usher in utopia. Of course, the, the reason, the, the, the difficulty here is the changing. And to do the changing, we need power, we need wealth, we need information. And that's beyond the scope of any one man, most likely. So we need the state. We need to reform the state. We need to restructure the state so that it will serve the best interest of humanity, that is, of all of us equally, while some of us remain a little more equal than the others and implement these plans because, again, and they would never say it this crassly, but it comes down to, we're smart people and we know stuff, and you're not. You're and Thomas fools. Sowell, as he in his book, as he's describing this vision, he's trying to be very even-handed so that you can come to understand the other side. He's not arguing for his own position, which if you know about the rest of his work at the Hoover Institute and everything else that he's written, you know he comes down on the side of the constrained vision. But yeah. as as he's writing in the book, he's he's trying to honestly show the best of each side, which the, is something to appreciate about him. As it, a writer. It's something to appreciate, but the problem is for Christians who are actually have attained uh, attained some degree of epistemological self-consciousness, which is to say, we actually know the Bible. Right. <laughs> um, we look at this presentation and say, well, this is a no-brainer. <laughs> right. Um, not not that the constrained vision has all the answers by any means. We'll talk about them next week. They, right. There's a show of <laughs> They of don't godliness. get a pass. <laughs> they don't get a pass, and we're yeah. going to talk about that. The soul is wrong. But in presenting the both sides, yeah, it, it, all he basically has to do is quote the founders of the movement and the rest of us stand back and gasp, like, <laughs> you're kidding. They really said this? Now, again, to give the, uh, the philosophers, the philosophers of, of the revolution their due, they were fools enough to believe that they themselves were good, well-intentioned, that they actually were acting in the interest of humanity, that they actually would bring in utopia, that they, in fact, could produce every virtue that Christianity promised, but without the superstition. They could they could bring about a new Jerusalem. And they were rather um, dismayed and shocked um, when they found out it wasn't working and that their own colleagues were calling them out for retaining far too much Christian capital on their mm -hmm. thinking. And the, but no, we 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 want good people. We've said the we've said the problem is the, the immorality of this lies in Christianity. We cut Christianity out. Of course, we're going to have a better, more moral system. And they had not thought to ask whose morality, by what standard. And so we look at someone like someone I. <laughs> I will, uh, but if I were honest, I would probably say despise, but certainly look at with chagrin is um, Mary Godwin Shelley's, I, I'm a guessing father, I'm not sure of the biology involved here, but William Godwin, 
who was husband to uh, the feminist uh, Mary Wollstonecraft. Uh, yeah, and yes, the, okay, I'm checking my notes, and yes, the, that's the father of, of Mary Godwin Shelley who invented uh, Frankenstein's Frankenstein. monster and all that. You know. <laughs> but uh, just to read the quotes uh, that Saul Marshall's explaining this guy's position uh, is, is horrifying. You mean there are really people, there were people within the first generation or two so... I used the phrase epistemological self-conscious earlier, that they were so honest with about their own presuppositions and where they led that they could say these things back in the late 17, early 1800s, and people were okay with this? <laughs> um, anyway, so we're going to start by, by running the Ten Commandments through the grid of the uh, unconstrained uh, vision. And, and see where we go. Now, by vision, he he means more or less what we would mean by worldview. Basic like set of you know, basic uh, assumptions about who man is and, and what man is capable of. Um, and, and here again, as you said, man, it's fundamentally good. And uh, there, are, since rationality is absolute, <laughs> if you're rational, you're rational. So it's like, you know, you can't be slightly pregnant. You can't be slightly rational. You'd already be right. <laughs> and if you are, well, then that's the highway to truth. That's the Audubon to truth. You just have to stay there. You just have to keep thinking and analyzing and deducing. And you will arrive at all truth. And the more truth you know, the more truth you can know. And it just keeps escalating, going exponential eventually. And, and, and so as this happens, you, you can... You can understand the world and you can create something wonderful and beautiful and loving and kind and nurturing for everybody. And then they look at the Ten Commandments, they look at Christianity. As, as from the beginning, it was an anti-Christian movement, uh, most certainly. And they were generally pretty clear about that. Now, in their minds, it wasn't always anti-theistic. They tended to, in the first generation or so, they tended to acknowledge a God of some sort. Uh, a god who was a divine geometer who, with one sweep of his compasses, created the universe. You know, that kind of thing. A god of Freemasonry and of universalism and all that. A deistic god. And eventually a Unitarian god. But then that all collapsed into pantheism. Uh, <laughs> transcendentalism. Transcendentalism. That's what you said, right? <laughs> yeah. That's, well, it's, yes. So, with that in mind, the first commandment. God says from Sinai, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Well, those of the, uh, and, and I'm probably going to say unconstrained vision wrong more than once. Feel free to correct <laughs> me when I do. Uh, those of the unconstrained vision, of course, are going to look at this and say, uh, wait, you have an absolute God whose reason transcends ours, whose character transcends ours, and in fact, sets absolutes for our morality, and whose um, uh, creativity it's such that he made the world. This is a huge embarrassment to us because we thought, you know, it's the thing of the of the big bully on the block until a bigger bully with higher tech moves in. Like, uh, no, no, we can't have him around because I now feel like a complete idiot and lamer. Well, yeah, you do. And as these men look at the God of the Bible, all they conclude is this is impossible. There can't be a God like this. I mean, morally, there can't be a God like this, because if there were a God like this, he would be able to tell me exactly what I am to do in every situation of my life, and I would have no appeal beyond that. Where's my freedom? Where's where's my humanity? I, I, I cease to be man at that point. Uh, and in his wisdom, he already knows the end from the beginning. Therefore, that means I'm set and fixed in my terms of my destiny, in terms of what I am and what I can make and what I can do. Again, I'm back to being a puppet. This this kind of, to even suggest this kind of God is more or less demonic, if they believed in a devil. Um, it's just, Another justification for this rebellion might be that if there's an absolute God who has an absolute standard, who's going to hold us accountable for that standard, that means that evolution is out the window, because then we're not constantly improving if there's an ultimate yes this is right we c there's a limit to how far we can go and maybe that's i don't know is that begging the question a little bit because we're assuming that man is unconstrained or is that just applying the <laughs> idea i'm not sure which that is 
Um, I, I, I don't know the idea, yeah, but the idea of infinite growth is impossible in a Christian setting. God sets the limits for man. First of all, man's a creature. Uh, even before the fall, man, man existed under severe limitations. Now they were pleasant. They were limitations designed by God Himself, who is all love and joy and truth. But there were things that man simply could not ever do, could not ever be. Uh, for the almost obvious, he can never be God. Wow. <laughs> uh, and then we enter the we, we factor in man's sin. Now there are things that man left to himself will never even want to do. He will never want to love God. He will never want to keep his covenants and contracts. He will not want to be faithful to one moment for life. He will not want to keep his hands off his neighbor's property. And the, uh, the children of the Enlightenment understood enough to say this morality that this God imposes is, is shackling. It is stifling. It, it keeps me from the full expression of who I am and what all that I can do. And therefore, morally and rationally, this God cannot exist. It is sheer superstition. And those who invented such a God are enemies of mankind. So we're off to a great start here, aren't we? Um, <laughs> I mean, I want to point out that we've just really talked about each of the Ten Commandments in yeah. this talking about the one, <laughs> which is kind of similar to our overview of the Ten Commandments and what yeah. they say. It The first does contain all of them, but so likewise, the rejection of the first one contains a rejection contains of all the of rejection them. of all of them. And ultimately, the rejection of any contains the rejection of all of them. Mm -hmm. The second commandment, no graven images. Well, now, the unconstrained vision is okay with that for a while, because putting things in stone <laughs> kind of fixes things. And and the unconstrained vision is all about freedom and development and the future and what in time will be called evolution, um, Hegelian uh, dialectical synthesis as we change and shift into the future, ever changing, ever becoming something in some sense better than we are, at least different from what we were. And so things carved in stone, they're okay that that goes away. Those kind of images can go. But until for, they make you feel nice. Then, until they make you feel nice. Uh, stone images, not so much. Celluloid images? Actually, uh, it, I would argue that stone <laughs> images are totally a thing. <laughs> totally a thing. Well, it depends, on, I guess, on which tradition you are and who you are. But, you know, America, we have not been fond of carving stone images. Well, we did some, I guess. We, we, we had our statues and monuments until this year. Uh, <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I was thinking about the New Age movement, though, and that, that is more bringing Eastern mysticism over. But Yeah. The um, socialism, progressivism, whatever you want to call it, this, this unconstrained vision, is, is fine in using temporary images. And we've seen that with the development of, of television and then now computer technology. Uh, throw an image up that startles, that shocks, that seduces, that entrances. Use it for manipulation, but then let it die away hmm. and come up with a new image. Because yesterday's images don't work. Ever gone back and watched a movie? Well, this, this is a bad question for you because I know, <laughs> I know you like and appreciate older movies. But try showing uh, an older movie to, you know, someone who's in high school now. And first of all, you'll get something like, I can't watch that. It's black and white. Um, <laughs> then they'll complain about the music, the background music. Then oh, it's act so cheesy. Yeah. And then the acting. Did they really, did people really talk like that back then? Uh, <laughs> the, my experience in asking teenagers what your few favorite movies are, it is rare for them to go back more than three or four years, if that, in picking a favorite movie. They are wholly unaware of what's gone before. They don't know the industry. They don't know the history of cinema and film and such uh, because they live in the moment. And I tend not to, so I'm ignorant of what they watch <laughs> oftentimes. Eventually, I may catch up with at least the good stuff. Once it's been around enough for me to find out, oh, that actually was good. I can watch it in reruns now, or what reruns are a thing of the past, I guess. <laughs> watch it on Netflix. Um, but yeah, the, the, the unconstrained vision will, will use images, but never tie us to them. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they let them go. And um, 
what's true with images, you could also make a case for in literature and music and so many other areas. Uh, we've, we've talked about the way this movement disdains history. Mm-hmm. Uh, Even disdains its own history. Its own history, oh, especially its own history. Yeah. They don't want to admit their own roots or the mistakes they've made or where they come from or who's on their side. <laughs> they, they, they are the voice of the present and of the future. Don't look back and don't look at the man behind the curtain. The, um, the third commandment. Now, we can think of a lot of ways in which liberals and, and socialists take God's name in vain. But the thing that I think that, uh, that Sol, uh, Sol brings out is the idea of commitment. Mm-hmm. To take God's name often, if not usually, is to take up a covenant, a contract, a commitment. Till death do us part, I swear to uphold this constitution. Uh, things of that sort. And from the point of view of the unconstrained vision, this, this is a problem because rationality, so argues, and, and he has again um, William Godwin as plentiful as evidence. The, the unconstrained vision says reason, rationality, but rationality is fed by new information. I do not know what new information may come today or tomorrow or next week or next month, but since it may inform reason and lead me to new conclusions that will be truth, that will be right. How can I possibly today commit myself to a course of action when tomorrow's headlines or tomorrow's newest scientific discovery will throw it all into a cat? I need to be free to chart a new course day by day. I need to be able to live in the existential moment with an eye on an ever-shifting future and thus commit as a right out um, you know, I, w- I, I want to marry this woman now because I think she's the most wonderful thing in the world. But what if just outside the door, there's a more wonderful woman? Well, obviously, I need to live in terms of my best interest. And this, as soon as I have that new information, I need to dump this lady and go after that one because it's about my self-fulfillment, my happiness, right? And you wouldn't constrain me to live under the decisions I made in my pitiful ignorance. You want me to be happy, don't you? Thomas Jefferson argued at one point that one generation should not be bound by the will of another. So really this whole mission of making a constitution, well, the kids will have to vote on it at some point or another to see if it still works for us. Yeah, amazing that. (laughs) But that that is the mindset. And it it is one of the real, once you acknowledge human autonomy, it is a real question. Because if I autonomously... If I'm even willing to make a commitment to this document or this person or this concept, how in the world can I impose that same commitment on my kid, my son, my daughter? There's no way. There's no way to justify that. He is his own autonomous individual. And so the philosopher struggled with the idea of how do we how do we have people renew the social contract generation after generation? John Locke opted for tacit consent. I'm not even sure what Rousseau's formula was or Hobbes, <laughs> but you know that that's a thing, and the idea that God imposes it—that these are covenant structures designed and authorized by God, in which He allows us to tinker on the details, but the the, the covenant form is His creation and His requirement, His ordinance—that doesn't fit this at all. We have, if we're going to work together, we commit, except we can't because new information. I'm I'm conspiring with you three guys today. Because I see a better world in it. Oh, wait, I find out that uh, three of you are jerks, and I found two other people over here who are much smarter. Bye. <laughs> While I stab you in the back and go over and join this new conspiracy, the, the conspirators can't trust each other. There is no honor here because faithfulness is not a virtue. New information leading to greater happiness, le- leading to a greater pragmatic approach to solving problems. Um, that's the thing. It's all about new information because that feeds reason, which we have already assumed is absolute and morally perfect. There's nothing, you can't criticize rationality. It's it's just a thing. Anymore, you can criticize the law of gravity. It's just, what are you going to drop off a building uh, so that you make use of the gravity? Yeah, here's a, here's a quote from um, William Godwin writing in uh, an inquiry concerning political justice in 1793. He says, am I precluded from better information for the whole course of my life. And if not for my whole life, why for a a year, a week, or even an hour? 
And again, his argument is, am I not allowed to argue, to act on the new information that I get today or tomorrow or next year? And if that's true, then commitments are worthless and, and they're self-defeating and they're self uh Equinating. They they just they they take away my wonderful freedom and autonomy to be everything I can be. Remember the Sabbath day. The Jewish Sabbath commemorated the creation of the world in six literal days. The New Testament Lord's Day commemorates Christ's resurrection from the dead. Now, the uh, unconstrained vision. Um, no, this is tying a, a cultural vision to what at best is an ancient historical fact, and at worst, a uh, historical superstition. Are we going to gauge our current culture and all of the future, all of our decisions, our constitutions, our social structures on something that happened 2,000 years ago or 6,000 years ago? Uh, dead hand of the past. No, it's, uh, we live in the present. Thank you very much. Now, if, if it turns out that man actually needs some kind of structure to his work and leisure, and both the French Revolution and the uh, Marxist Revolution, Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, came to that conclusion, uh, then we will have the experts sorted out for us. We will do the biological, physiological studies. Uh, we'll find something finally for PE majors to do, <laughs> where they can actually figure out how much rest and how much work we need for the betterment of the race. We'll ask the expert, experts. They'll tell us they know more than we do. But, it's funny uh, to me that a lot of productivity efficiency type influencers on YouTube nowadays are recognizing the the need for a Sabbath or at least a secularized version of a Sabbath because it's on their terms. It's not on God's terms. Oh, yeah. But that's pretty recent, I think, as far as the mainstream work culture. I mean, oh, obviously yeah. it's showed up throughout history as like, oh, it turns out you do need a day of rest. <laughs> but like, I feel like a especially a lot of work in the 90s and 2000s was like, you need to be putting in those weekend hours. You just can't yeah. stop. You're going to fall behind. Yeah, you have to keep pushing. There's always more to do. And the early bird gets the worm and all that. If you're not on top of it, someone else will be. So yes, go to the gym and take care of yourself. Get the required number of hours of sleep, which are probably less than you think. But keep pushing. Uh, time off for worship. Let's time off where you actually consciously say, I'm not even thinking about my job today. That's, that's the death of success. Success means pushing. And you're right, it's beginning to change. But as you say, changing in terms of uh, a man-centered formula. Uh, you you want to be happy and healthy well. Guess we were kind of wrong in the advice we used to give you because it <laughs> seems like you maybe do need a day off. So go play for a while or something, but uh, then get right back on top of that again. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God gives you. Uh, again, the, the the whole focus of the unconstrained movement is, is pushing forward into the future. The future is better than the past. The future today has more information than yesterday. Tomorrow will have more information than today. A decade from now, we'll have more information. We will keep on learning. We will keep on processing. We will keep on thinking. We will have more data. We will process it more efficiently. So anything that is relatively past for us is just dragging us down. It is superstition. It is ignorance. It's the bigotry of an earlier time. And we don't need it, and our children most certainly do not need it. So uh, it is not the job of parents to uh, prejudice their children, program them, educate them, discipline them. Uh, the children, again, are, are largely good, free, independent beings. Just leave them alone. They'll be fine. In fact, their problems probably come from you. You've inculcated some kind of neuroses or psychoses into them by your poor uh, parental training stuff going on there. And um, anyway, you don't have any rights in them anyway. They are part of a collective <laughs> whole. They belong to the state. And uh, the sooner you get out of the way and let them become themselves, the better. Of course, homeschooling, Christian schooling, of any sorts, right out. Public school seems to be the has been a major theme. I'm I'm wondering what I'm wondering what the next step is since we watched this whole uh, school online thing going on. 
It will be interesting to see what turns this takes. Because in the past, the push has always been more children in class, more time, more hours of the day, more years of their lives. Under Bill and Hillary, it was even, yes, and we need something else to bridge the gap after the college years. So some kind of um, civil service or something or military service or industrial service as part of your education, because we just need to, we need more time to educate you properly. We need more money to construct the best environment and we need more information to and that, make you what you ought to be. And that impulse goes back hundreds of years. It's not a Bill and Hillary thing no, in its origin. Pushed, they, just they just have carried it, it on. A, they <laughs> yeah. revived it at a key moment when we were almost susceptible to it. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering what's, what's going to happen next. We'll find out soon yeah. enough, I should think. Don't kill. Thou shall do no murder. Oh, well, man. again, you know, the unconstrained vision. <laughs> Tell this vision. to the Ukrainian peasants. Oh, yeah. my gosh. In, in theory, the unconstrained vision would say, no, you shouldn't kill people. I mean, life is important. Life is valuable. Right up there with human happiness. Um, now, the, the, the problem is that to get from where we are to a world where everyone can live, long and happily, there are some obstacles. And in this, they're at least a little bit realistic. They actually realize that not everyone agrees with them and that some people are <laughs> going to put up resistance. Wow. Uh, they look at the existing social structures. They looked at the monarchy in France and then later in Russia. They looked at the capitalism of Western Europe and America and said, there are some problems. They looked at the Christian church and said, there are some problems here. And, you know, it'd be nice if we could just tell them the truth and they all lay down everything, their money, their their lands, their titles, their guns, and 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 put us in place so that we could fix everything. But they're probably not going to do that. And then the dark, dirty thing that 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 rarely gets mentioned, and then you just did. <laughs> there's the slow drag of the lower classes. They have been oppressed so long. They are so ignorant. Uh, they are so stifled that they're basically irredeemable. I mean, sure, we love the poor and we'd love to help them along, but the truth is that most of them are beyond the reach of even our sophisticated education. And so, you know, if we're going to have a governmental system that works, it's easier to rule 200,000 than 2 million. Some people may just have to go. You mentioned Ukrainian peasants and to read the history of Marxist, of uh, Russian Marxism, is to weep for how many people died horribly in order that they could have a paradise on earth. I mentioned offline that um, I've been reading Whitaker Chambers' book, Witness. Yes. Um, and this was a key theme for him, because for him, uh, when he was becoming a communist, he was he was a communist agent who worked in the in the United States in the 1920s and 30s, um, who broke from the Communist Party and then informed on all the underground workings. Um, but what he gradually came to realize was communism that that was what brought him into the communist fold was this commitment that this vision of the world is the right vision. And so mm -hmm. even if people die, it is worth it. Yeah. And eventually what kind of prompted him to leave the Communist Party was a break with that vision to say, no, this is too horrible. I, I can't stomach this anymore. Yeah. Just the sheer numbers. It's no longer a theory of some people might have to die. It's There is no possible way that what we're doing is not evil. Yeah. But that, of course, means that you now have a standard for good and evil. Right. And Which is why Whitaker Chambers says it is a crisis of faith. It is a crisis of faith. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about primary religious commitment, your faith. Where is your faith? Is it in the goodness and the intellectual capability of man? Or is it in a sovereign God who declares the end from the beginning? Uh, in, in <laughs> To say that this has 
this is a personal affair for Sundays and maybe Wednesday nights, completely mistakes reality and the nature of mankind, the nature of civilization. The arguments are religious and they have to be fought on a religious basis. And sadly, uh, when the other side can't win it on a religious basis, they do resort to guns and guillotines and poison gas and torture chambers. And, you know, you go down the list. The history of, of socialism, Marxism, progressivism is very bloody. And so, yes, in theory, thou shalt not kill, but practically, um, you know, eggs and omelets. We want that better world. Some people are going to have to die. And they're not necessarily going to be the rich and powerful and the famous. They're not necessarily going to be the aristocrats or the people on Wall Street. A lot of them are going to just be the dead weight, as they would think of it, of ordinary lower class and lower middle class people who are just annoyed. Middle class people probably too, once we take all their stuff. So don't kill unless you need to. And then, of course, it's a question of who is it don't you kill and who defines who gets killed? Who is the dead weight? Older people with dementia, locked in nursing homes, babies in the womb, Christians. Who exactly don't we kill and on what basis? Don't commit adultery. We, we basically have already talked about this because, at least on one level, this is an issue of commitment. It's also an issue of uh, thrill and excitement in the moment. If I want to be happy in the moment, then I need to be sexually free to do what I want to do. So anything that shackles me, shackles my sexual life, shackles me in my preferences and commitments, yeah, that's right out. And of course, from the beginning, uh, the beginnings of revolutionary socialism, you can go back as far as the Illuminati, uh, the attack has always been on the family, uh, both sexually and as uh, the, 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 the main uh, custodian of capital and of children and thus of the future. Family's got to go because the family is the next to the church. The family is the most conservative element within society. Mm -hmm. And as long as you have families and marriage and commitment and people who own money and pass it on to their children, this new have responsibility to one another. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. Don't steal. Well, we just hit that one, didn't we? <laughs> For the unconstrained vision, one of the primary problems is that is this unequal risk distribution of wealth. Well, we just need to have the power to take money from those who have way too much and give it to the way, those who have way too little, and everybody will thank us afterward. Because after again, a, you're trying to level out the environment that people exist in, so that yeah. all of everybody's nature can be improved equally. So that you're changing the nature by changing the environment. You know, or, or allowing the nature to come out clear, because again, the, the assumption is that man's nature is good. Mm -hmm. That means necessarily the problems in the environment. Now, within the 20th century, the environment can can include our own genetic makeup, mm -hmm. which is still something outside of our autonomy. It's something that we haven't yet completely controlled, but really should. But uh, yeah, these these are external things, and if we simply address the energies of the state to correct these things so that we all, why, why do people suffer? Because they don't have enough. Why are some people arrogant and disdainful? Because they have too much. It's easy, just redistribute. Put us all in the same starting point. Yes, it will be a blow to industry, but that's all right. Who needs industry anyway? Besides, we're gonna thin the population, remember? And we're going to use the power of the state to achieve what, and the modern term, of course, is social justice which means equality on a horrendous, unthinkable level. We, we, so long in America, we've used the word equality in a illusory way when we talk about all men being created equal. When, when that was written, nobody took it the way people have taken it ever <laughs> since. In fact, they, they borrowed it from the, uh, I think it was from the uh, Virginia State uh, Constitution. And it was talking about, first of all, white English men, rights of Englishmen, property owners, and they're talking about uh, a particular way of viewing said people in terms of civil society. There were slaveholders who could sign on to the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal without a blink, because it never in their first imaginations thought that it meant that one person is interchangeable with another person. 
And yet I find myself more and more as a, as a teacher having to address this in, in, in every year harder because children, teenagers have heard this. Teachers have heard this over and mm -hmm. over again. In America, don't we believe that all men are created equal? I sure hope not. Okay, you, 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 let's get a full view mirror. You stand there. I'll stand next to you. Let's look in the mirror. Are we equal? Well, we're not the same. Yes, exactly. You want to <laughs> not compare the same means not equal. <laughs> it means not equal. You want to compare checkbooks. You want to compare education. You want to compare health records. What? What? Well, it, we're more. Yeah, as uh, Jane Stuttick says, to ransom that heat of strength. I thought it was in the soul that men were most were were equal. And he says, no, that's the place where they're least equal. Um, the, the nature of our walk with God. Uh, the fruit of the spirit that he brings forth in us. There's no equality here. So, you know, anyway, that's the, this whole idea that we can somehow, by government edict and government control and power, make people equal. One, is nonsense. But two, why would we want to exactly? Do I really want the guy with great strength and dexterity and, and skillful hands trying to... I don't know, when, as over against the guy who understands how electricity works, over against the guy who understands how the human body works and what nutrition can do for it. And what, are all of these equal? Do we want to plug? Let's, let's make them all janitors so that we can all be equal. That's not it. That's, that's what we're saying, or worse. Let's all make them workers in some factory plugging the same tab A into slot B all day long. There's equality for you. There's no justice there. There's no equality. There's tyranny. There's slavery. There's the slavery of becoming the cog in the machine when all differences are suppressed and we are not allowed to excel at the thing that God gifted us with. Don't bear false witness. Faithful testimony in or out of court, the unconstrained vision would say, well, you know, truth is good in its own way. What I'm telling you is the truth for today. Or my truth. My truth for today. In fact, let's not talk about truth. Truth itself. In fact, the word truth is outdated. Your story, my story. Truth is a construct. Truth is a construct, you know. Uh, and this has happened so fast when, when I was even your age that, yeah, we talked about Hegelian relativism. <laughs> but nobody actually tried to put it into, into operation except in the most academic terms. Uh, yeah, no, one plus one was still two for everybody. Uh, gravity was still minus 30 feet per second per second for everybody. But now, nothing. Every, everything is up for grabs. There is no truth. There is only the story that will promote the agenda uh, that, will, that will move the train along the tracks we're on. And if I need to tell you a different story tomorrow, what's the problem with that? The, the goal is what it's all about. And you can think here of 1984. Mm -hmm. you know, we can devise our own history, we can devise our own language, and what do we say tomorrow need have nothing to do with what we, you think we said yesterday, because even your memories are not to be trusted. The books, we don't, you don't have any of those anymore. We burn them all. And so don't covet. The law demands contentment and personal charity. And neither of these is what the unconstrained vision wants. First of all, contentment. Well, the problem is you're too content already. You need to be revolutionary. You need to be full of change. You need, you need to see all the problems of the world and fix them today, not tomorrow. If you're trying to fix them tomorrow, you are already a sellout. Everything needs to happen right now, right now in the moment. And if you're not on board, you're part of the problem. And uh, personal charity, too little, too late. You know, if your great great grandparents wanted to try that, that's their business. But that's long ago, where things are too bad, too severe. We're in the we're in the car going over the cliff, and we need wings right now. We we nothing nothing else will work, and so we need your total allegiance. We must revel in our discontent. The world isn't perfect, but we can make it such. Just give us any back power, knowledge, presence and money. Let us take on the attributes of God, and we can fix this for you. We'll take from the have-nots, give to the... I can take from the haves, give to the have-nots, and everyone will marvel at how easily utopia showed up. We play Robin Hood, and everyone applauds. And love, 
love is that you sit back and accept all of this because you want the best for everybody. And why would you ever question our good intentions? We mean well. Isn't that what it's all about? We're so sincere. Chambers writes that communists hold that to give alms is to dull the revolutionary spirit of the masses. Yes. Excellent. Exactly. We don't want the masses more content. We want them less content. We need to stir we up trouble. We don't want them grateful or, no. you know, spurred you know, on to. And if we find out that, that some rich capitalist is about to give them a bunch of food, we burn the food. And then blame some capitalists for having done it, obviously, because we're- well, How condescending. Yeah. You know. So, yeah. So there we are. This this is, we're measuring what is essentially the, the pop view that shows up on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and whatever else, major media network outlets, if there are still any, Netflix originals and such. This is the voice of our world. And sadly, it is the voice of the church more often than not, because for the very reason the church has not faced morality from a Christian point of view, from a biblical point of view. They have not said, here's what the Bible says about right and wrong, aside from the very simplest things, like you should love your neighbor, you should be nice, you should maybe work hard, maybe. You know, the rest is about loving Jesus, which again is still undefined. What does it mean to love Jesus? The Bible would insist it means at the very least keeping the Ten Commandments. <laughs> If, if you can't do that, then whatever you're doing springs from, one, your own sentimentality, which, two, is structured in terms of the worldview you've been handed by someone thing, somewhere or something that's not the Bible. Your, your high school teachers, your college professors, Facebook, social media, something has handed you this script of, here's what nice people, here's what good people, here's what loving people are like. And your church tells you, go be nice, kind, and loving. And between the two, you end up with, oh, progressivism is pretty cool. And it's the wave of the future. And it's the way Christian people should act and love it. How dare you criticize me for the way I vote? Because the Bible has nothing to say about politics, right? <laughs> or isn't that exactly what we're talking about? Well, anyway, so that's the first look. We're going to go next time. We're going to, Lord willing. Actually, it won't be next time, will it? A week from today, Lord willing. <laughs> Okay, a week from today, we will, um, we're going to look at conservatism, hopefully with the same uh, rigor, mm -hmm. and see, although it may have a few more things to commit it, there's still some radical, and radical means at the root, right. problems with it, where it, no more than, than uh, revolutionary uh, socialism, has answers for our culture and for our time. That should be fun to look forward to. Yeah, that will be fun. Do you have any recos to sign off with? Thanksgiving. Uh, Thanksgiving, especially at a time like this. This is a hard time to stop and look at what has happened in the last 11 months and say to God, thank you. It's easier to, comply, to complain and to whine and gripe. And to point out all the evils in the world, and there are many, and all the evil people in power, and they are considerable. And to forget that it is God's hand that has orchestrated all of us, and he said it for our good. Uh, he has put us where we are because this is what we need to be more like Jesus. And this is what the kingdom of God needs in order, through the dark shadows, to move into its next position for conquering the world. Uh, the heathen rage, the people imagine a vain thing, God laughs. And it's not the laughter of viciousness, maniacal laughter of the villain who's <laughs> playing games with pawns. It is the amused laughter of her father saying, they have no idea the gifts they're handing my children. <laughs> They'll see. And so we need to be thankful. Real thanksgiving, real prayers, real songs of, of praise and worship. And, and, and in consequence, we're rejoicing with our families because God is God and we're not. And we can thank God for that. That's great. I'm just going to say amen to that because that was that was real good. Let's close on that. Thank you so much for listening. Um, well, thank you, Greg, for this conversation. Thanks to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to our financial supporters. We appreciate you. If you want to get in touch with us, you can send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. 
um, our website, which I haven't mentioned in a while, is anchor.fm slash halting toward Zion. Uh, that's toward without an S because we're Americans. Toward. <laughs> uh, so we hope to hear from you. Thanks for listening. Thank you.